You're listening to This Week in Cardiology from theheart.org on Medscape. You can now access the latest in medical news on your Amazon Alexa-enabled device. Join me, Perry Wilson, every weekday morning for Medscape Medical Minute, where I highlight the top medical stories of the day. To add Medscape Medical Minute to your flash briefing, search for Medscape Medical Minute on Amazon and click Enable. Or open the Amazon Alexa app, go to Skills, search for Medscape Medical Minute, and click Enable. Then say, Alexa, what's the news? Or, Alexa, what's my flash briefing? I hope you'll join us. Hi, everyone. This is John Mandrola from the Heart.org Medscape Cardiology. And this is This Week in Cardiology for January 29th, 2021. This week... COVID, a fib in COVID, clots in COVID, the novel drug Verisiguat, and POTS. First, a quick announcement. I've got a couple of requests about show notes, and we're working on this. Right now, if you want to find the studies, read a partial transcript, find some show notes, you go to the heart.org Medscape cardiology page, and there's a This Week in Cardiology link there, and it's all there. We're also working on getting the show notes on different podcast players as well. Okay, so first up is always COVID. Now, my review of the Johns Hopkins site this week reveals entirely good news. I mean, cases in the U.S., especially in California, are in steep decline. Vaccines are being rolled out, albeit with difficulty. And a new one-shot J&J vaccine is potentially on the horizon soon. I'm really looking forward to getting back to normal. First topic is AFib and COVID-19 in the hospital. The Northwell Group in New York has published a study in Heart Rhythm Journal looking at the effect of AFib in patients who were admitted with COVID-19. This was about 9,500 patients from 13 hospitals in their system who had COVID-19 over a two-month period in the spring. The authors actually used natural language processing to identify and classify AFib cases, which is kind of an interesting technique. They found that AFib occurred in nearly 1,700, or about 1 in 5, COVID patients. These patients formed one study group. The control group were patients without AFib, and obviously these groups will differ in characteristics, so the authors used propensity matching to attempt to match the patients with AFib and those without AFib. Things they pair patients on in propensity matching are smoking history, age, BMI, etc. Now, the key finding of this study was that having AFib increased the risk of in-hospital death 54% versus 37%, and the rate ratio was about 1.5. Now, my comments is that this is observational, non-randomized, likely biased study, but I believe the results. Why? Well, the authors nicely explain in the paper that AFib serves as a risk factor for death and many other conditions that afflict patients sick enough to be in the hospital. Uh, Things like sepsis, MI, and heart failure. And this association between AFib and worse hospital mortality is probably both causal and non-causal. Namely, AFib surely serves as a marker for more advanced cardiac disease. That's the correlative part. But AFib also complicates therapy, and that's the causal part. Indeed, any doctor sees patients who are sick in the ICU with AF. These patients are hanging on by a thread, and when AFib occurs, it drops the cardiac output, lowers blood pressure, decreases renal perfusion, and increases the already higher odds of thrombus. And the drugs for AFib come with risks and downsides, and then you cardiovert the patient, and the AFib just comes roaring back because, of course, they're full up with inflammation. I highlight this study in heart rhythm not because it surprises or not because it advances COVID-19 care, but because it highlights the all-important notion that except in rare cases, AFib occurs as a downstream effect of stuff that affects the atrium that puts stress on the atria. In the case of pneumonias, AFib occurs because of the hypoxia and the inflammatory response and the illness. In the case of obesity or sleep apnea or hypertension, AFib occurs because of electrical and structural atrial disease. My friends, when you see AFib, always look upstream. Something is causing it to happen. And you treat that cause, AFib likely improves.
Next topic is COVID and thrombosis. Now, Circulation recently published a cardiac pathology series from Italian and American authors of 40 patients who died from COVID-19. The author's goal was to determine the pathologic mechanisms of cardiac injury. They divided the hearts according to the presence or absence of myocardial necrosis, and then they strive to determine the underlying mechanisms of the cardiac injury. About one-third, 14 of these 40 patients, had evidence of myocyte necrosis, and this was predominantly in the left ventricle. Cardiac thrombi were present in 11 of 14, 78% of these cases with necrosis. In about 2 of 14, or 14%, of these patients had epicardial coronary artery thrombi, while 9 of the 14, 64%, had microthrombi in myocardial capillaries, arterioles, and small muscular arteries. Journalist Deborah Beck has nice coverage in which she interviewed the senior author who emphasized not only what they saw, but what they didn't see. The majority of patients in this study with myocardial injury were these small areas of infarct and microthrombi in small vessels. What they didn't see was any evidence of myocarditis and or huge infarcts in, like, say, the LAD territory. The senior author said, what we're seeing here is not clinically detectable. There is no test that will tell you there are microthrombi and no imaging test that will show you these focal areas of necrosis, but that doesn't mean it's not there. Now, this same group has also recently published another autopsy series in Jack in which they showed that myocarditis is a very rare finding in COVID-19 autopsies. Let me repeat, myocarditis is rare in autopsies of COVID-19 hearts. And these are patients who are selected to have autopsy. In other words, they were super sick and died. Presumably, they had tons of inflammation going on. Now, the authors went a bit further in their most recent paper. They then assessed the components of these microthromboemboli in two ways. One was to compare the components of the microemboli with both COVID-positive and COVID-negative patients who had had macroemboli within the myocardium. Now, this was due to epicardial obstructions. And another way they compared it was to, with clots aspirated during PCI for STEMI in non-COVID patients. The autopsy-obtained microthrombi had significantly more fibrin and terminal complement in immunostating. Now, of course, I don't know what terminal complement immunostating is. I had to look it up. Basically, the higher fibrin and more complement components suggest that these microemboli in COVID-19 is likely based in immune reactions. I highlight this interesting study because COVID-19 is a novel disease. And as it was in the early days of understanding atherosclerotic heart disease, pathology and pathologists led the way. Yet, Caution here is warranted. I mean, everyone believes that COVID-19 is especially strong in its ability to cause thrombosis, and this study supports that. But I'm not so sure about the COVID thrombosis connection. First, we don't have very good controls. For instance, it is easy to believe the thrombosis rate is significantly higher in COVID-19, and we say this because clot rates in COVID are higher than in previous flu outbreaks or in past studies of patients with other serious medical diseases. But isn't it also true that in 2021, we're a lot better at detecting thrombosis, like VTE, for instance? What if next year we use the same intensity to look for thrombosis in patients with RSV or influenza? Also, we, we full well know that COVID-19 more often affects older, sicker people, people who already have a predilection to have altered hemostasis. So is it the virus or is it the host? Finally, Pathology cannot at all determine the best therapy, say, anticoagulation. We will soon learn the results of three RCTs looking at anticoagulation in patients with COVID-19. The press releases of these studies suggest very mixed results. Next topic is the novel heart failure drug, Verisiguat. Last week, FDA approved this drug for the treatment of patients with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. The hard-to-pronounce drug stimulates guanylate cyclase, which ultimately sensitizes cells to endogenous nitric oxide. And that may be important because in heart failure, endothelial dysfunction and reactive oxygen species reduce nitric oxide bioavailability, and that results in a relative deficiency of soluble guanylate cyclase and reduced cyclic GMP generation. 
Now, the selectivity of verisiguat for cyclic GMP does not occur with other vasotilatory drugs like nitrates or phosphodiesterase inhibitors. Now, little of this biochemistry matters to the clinician and patient, right? We care about outcomes. And outcomes comes from placebo-controlled trials, specifically the Victoria trial published in the New England Journal of Medicine in May of 2020. Let's talk about that trial. About 5,000 patients with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, age 67, mostly male with a mean ejection fraction of 28%. As it usually is in heart failure trials, the primary endpoint was CV death or first hospital admission for heart failure. And the results were quite modest. Over just 11 months, not even a year, a primary endpoint occurred in 35% in the versiguat arm, 38% in the placebo arm. It's a hazard ratio of 0.90, a 10% relative risk reduction. Now, the confidence intervals for this hazard ratio went from 0.82 to 0.98. Note, the lower bound or best case of only 0.82 Confidence intervals are hard to define exactly, but here we can be 95% certain that the true mean difference in the two arms is not better than an 18% reduction. The p-value calculated at 0.02. Now let's look at the components of this primary endpoint. CV death was 16.4% in the verisiguat arm versus 17.5% in the placebo arm. Again, a very small relative risk reduction of only 7%. Absolute risk reduction was 1.1%. And the total difference in CV death of this trial of more than 5,000 patients was just 27 fewer CV deaths. For heart failure hospitalizations, the incidence was 27.4% with verisigua, 29.6% in the placebo arm, the relative risk reduction 10%, absolute risk reduction 2.2%. Neither of the components of the primary endpoint alone reached statistical significance. Overall death also did not reach statistical significance. But perhaps you didn't believe me that these results are modest. So let's review some other major trial results of other guideline-directed therapies for heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. Carvedilol, for instance, 65% reduction in death in the trial was stopped early for efficacy, overall death. Sacubitril valsartan and Paradigm, 20% reduction in CV death or heart failure hospitalization. Again, the trial was stopped early for efficacy. There were significant reductions in CV death. Spironolactone, a ROUSE trial, 30% reduction in death, stopped early for efficacy. Dapaglifosin, DAPA heart failure trial, 26% reduction in CV death and heart failure hospitalizations, and this included a significant reduction in CV death. So, relative to beta blockers, RAS inhibitors, MRAs, SGLT2 inhibitors, Verisigwad has very modest effects. We can't use expensive drugs in common conditions unless they have more than just a little positive effect. New drugs must reach some threshold of benefit. By FDA approving the drug, the stimulus to do another trial to either confirm or refute this borderline findings is unlikely. Next topic is POTS. On a scale of complexity, if ablation of SVT is on one pole, so this is one pathway, one burn, and boom, cure, then postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome is on the other. POTS is about as complex and difficult a condition to treat as there is in cardiology. When I gave a lecture in Calgary and the Leibniz Institute a couple of years ago, the team there let me know they were happy to have Dr. Satish Raj. Happy not only because Satish is calm and smart and kind, but also that he was interested in treating patients with autonomic disorders and POTS. So Jack published the clinical trial from Dr. Raj's group. Lead author was Kate Bourne. This was 30 patients, uh, 28 females, mean age 32. These patients underwent 10-minute head-up tilt table testing with each of four compression conditions. This was a compression garment. And the baseline control condition was no compression. Then there was lower leg compression only abdomen and thigh compression, and then full abdomen and leg compression. Now, crucially, Dr. Raj and colleagues carefully selected their patients 
These patients had a physician diagnosis of POTS. It was a greater than 30 beats per minute increase in heart rate. It was association with orthostatic symptoms in the absence of orthostatic hypotension and in the absence of medications that could increase heart rate. And the results of this experiment were clear. The compression garment reduced heart rate during head-up tilt. It improved symptoms in a dose-dependent manner. If you go to the Jack paper, figure 4 elegantly shows the graded response of leg, abdomen, and full compression relative to the control group of no compression. Also confirmatory was the observation in the study that patients who had the greatest heart rate response at baseline For example, the patients with the most severe POTS had the greatest heart rate reduction with compression. Born et al. concluded that this compression garment, when used in the highest dose or most compression, reduced heart rate and improved symptoms during a head-up tilt. Journalist Patrice Wendling has very nice coverage, including some worthy comments from the authors. Here is Dr. Raj. He said, maybe we're picking up low-hanging fruit. This is a simple therapy that's cheap. It's free of any long-term side effects and relatively free of short-term side effects besides the nuisance of putting these things on. But the key message, he said, is that we can help people. We're trying to give tools to the average physician who is seeing these patients because most of these patients aren't seen by specialty autonomic centers. Now, my comments are that I love this study because it is elegant. And remember what elegant in science means, pleasingly ingenious and simple. Born and colleagues were selective in their experiment, though. They made sure patients had truly abnormal responses to head-up tilt. Pots in the wild may not be that simple. Two luminaries in the field, Dr. Bendit and Dr. Sutton, wrote the editorial accompanying this experiment. My friends, get this editorial, read it, and go to the references. What you will learn is that POTS has become a much broader condition, and this may include symptoms unrelated to posture, such as chronic fatigue, migraine, GI disturbances, and even brain fog. Head-up tilt testing, they write, may only address a small part of POTS. In their editorial, they link to two worthy papers, one a review by Brian Olshansky and others, and the other a position statement from the Canadian Cardiac Society, and this was authored by the same Dr. Satish Raj and others. In reading both these papers, I learned a lot about the overlap and complexities in diagnosing and treating this condition. And I cover this topic because most of us don't have the luxury of referring patients to a group like Dr. Raj's. We have to take care of these patients ourselves. One constant, helping patients with POTS, requires the skill to rule out secondary causes, empathy and patience to work with people with hard-to-treat conditions, and a strong advocacy for exercise training, focusing specifically on non-upright exercise, like rowing, for instance. The compression garment study may help as a bridge until patients can get better cardiorespiratory fitness. As Dr. Olshansky wrote in his review, quote, there is little evidence to indicate that currently available pharmacologic intervention is effective for reversing or shortening a course of primary idiopathic POTS or even improving outcomes aside from a placebo effect. So that's it for this week in cardiology. As always, I'm grateful that you listened. Thank you. And remember, if you like this podcast, please take the time to give us a rating, write us a review. It really helps others find us. Until next week, this is John Mandrola from the heart.org Medscape Cardiology. You're listening to This Week in Cardiology from the heart.org on Medscape.